Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to another of the director's hours that we that we bring you. Uh, as in the past, the two p entities that are bringing you this is Stellenbosch Graduate Institute, an online business school, and our partners at Fluid Rock, uh, who you would know from previous introductions, are an independent governance firm and uh, an entity that has a whole suite of services for companies and especially their boards. And I think what joins us together is uh, Fluid Rock's uh, dream of a society fueled by ethical and well-governed corporate uh, citizens. And that I think resonates well with us and what we are doing on this side. Welcome to our esteemed audience. And then also uh, our guest uh, speaker, Dr. Sabine Demboski, whom I will introduce uh, in a minute. Uh, our topic today is uh, a European perspective on what matters to boards now. Now, I understand and it's logical for all of us that different regional contexts uh, are dealing with this crisis and where we are at the moment in different ways. And even with our own normality, we're dealing in different ways. But I think it's also good from time to time to look through our own context window into the garden of other contexts and see what is happening on the other side and could we learn anything from that and could we from this side offer advice to that side and that's why we thought it well to bring uh, Dr. Sabine Dembowski on board this week uh, to share with us uh, her experience on that side in the UK and the European environment on what is what is on the board's radar at the moment. So Sabine, as you've seen from the, the bio, is the founder and the managing partner for Better Boards, where the focus are on to make boards much more effective. And I have experienced Sabine from our conversations is very practical and that's also shown through an evidence-based approach in dealing with boards and to get actual measurable results. So we are really looking forward to tap into that experience and, and listen to you, Sabine. And she also has a guest that is from South Africa who may join us uh, if, we, if the technology allow us at some point. Uh, Alex Lee, who is a technical uh, VC investor, uh, in the in the in the UK, uh, somebody who started off in engineering, uh, tech startups, and uh, entrepreneurship, and all of that experience is standing him in good stead where he is now an investor in the banking environment. So Sabine, with any without any further introductions, I am handing over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to be with you in uh, South Africa, one of my favorite countries on earth. Uh, you're in absolutely stunning surroundings. Um, let me tell you a little bit the story why uh, Alexander is the guest of honor. Alexander is South African. He studied in Stellenbosch. He's sitting uh, in a venture capital firm, uh, the Development Bank of Wales in the UK. Uh, and uh, he was very instrumental in securing the funding for better boards. So uh, I just wanted to draw the link because I think it's beautiful to see South Africans are everywhere um, and uh, made, this, uh, made better boards happen in the way it is uh, today. So I will talk about um, what matters to boards now. Uh, at Better Boards, we do uh, board evaluations, board reviews, board development programs. And behind our approach are five years of solid research. We are at the moment the only board evaluators who have made uh, what we are actually doing subject to international peer review processes. So the foundations of what we are doing are peer reviewed and published in the US, in the UK and, uh, and across Europe. Um, so what you will see here in these few slides uh, before our discussion are very practical insights from recent board evaluations uh, in Corona times and after um, 
and then a, a little bit of uh, our approach. And then it's up to you uh, to come in with lots of questions. So I would like to refer to copyright, you know, as a passionate academic, uh, if you would like to make use of any of the slide graphs or verbal statements, uh, please credit us uh, or write to us and we work together with you. So what we are seeing at the moment also here in Europe uh, is, of course, a battle for survival in Corona times. On the one hand, big discussions going on to protect the health of the population, to protect vulnerable people in society, to protect the elderly. But on the other hand, the need to keep the economy going. Most parts in Europe have also been in the lockdown and the lockdowns are just easing up as we speak this week, a little bit last week and the economic fallout is very, very severe. So what this has done is in this time, it was really all hands uh, are on deck. It is not that boards are sitting back and just watch from the distance uh, what is happening. Um, so the focus of boards in this lockdown time in this acute crisis was to focus really on employees and customers. And the, the goal really was to keep employees well, to keep them employed and to keep them mentally healthy. So a lot of organizations in Europe have made use of uh, follow schemes. So the government was actually paying employees, securing part or all of their salaries in order to keep them employed, in order to minimize the detrimental economic impact uh, on organizations. And that required quite a dramatic shift about the way organizations work here. Um, so we are coming together now in, in this, in this virtual environment, many, many countries in Europe are actually uh, lagging behind um, digital developments. So it is not at all that all employees in the organizations in the UK or across Europe were used to work in the virtual world. They had to learn it. Um, and in the initial weeks of the acute crisis, the boards were actually working with executive teams in order to ensure that the infrastructure is working. So it was all hands on deck, making sure that people can work remotely, can work from their homes. A lot of things had to be reorganized. And from what I'm hearing, everyone is quite surprised how relatively smooth this process was. Of course, don't get me wrong, it was completely chaotic. But nevertheless, yeah, everyone was so surprised how people adapted to the virtual world. And at least in the professional services field, in the white color world, um, people managed to work. So things were, can happen and were happening. As we are now coming out of the lockdown, uh, I put together here the top questions that are currently asked and discussed on boards in Europe. Um, the governments across Europe are using various schemes to keep the social fabric um, intact. I mentioned furlough schemes. There are lots of grants available, credits, loans available in order to support business and get through this very difficult economic times. So there are discussions about what governments can and should organizations use. A big, big discussion going on, for example, in the aviation industry with airlines, which are, of course, heavily affected by this. If they accept government money, of course, they have also to deal with the influence of government as long as they make use of their money. And there are big discussions going on if this is useful or not. 
They try to assess currently the financial impact on the organizations. Um, tech firms were doing well, but uh, think hospitality, think aviation, think, uh, think office space, think transportation, think um, manufacturing, textile industry. All of these industries, the financial impact only becomes clear uh, at the moment. And then now the big, big question, what is the true impact on the existing business model? It is very certain that we will not go back to how we lived and how we did things in February 2020. Only a short while ago, and things have dramatically changed, and now boards are grappling, trying to think strategically, what does this really mean? What, what's the impact on our business model? How do we have to change? At the same time, it's not over yet. Yeah, there are big discussions about the second wave, potentially a third wave. We seem to have a little bit of a breathing space at the moment in uh, Europe, but um, experts are quite clear that uh, a second wave in autumn, winter is quite certain. And uh, how do we come safely out and how do we prepare for a potential second wave? This has huge implications for operations. So with a strategic oversight, the board uh, provides um, a lot of processes, how business is done, how workflows work, have to be changed. And how do we have to adjust our offerings to satisfy our customers? Customer needs have changed dramatically in this short space of time. Many industries will never be back uh, as they were a couple of months ago. And uh, now a lot of searches are going on trying to understand the client needs, customer needs, and how do we incorporate this into the formulation of our new strategy for the new world we are living in. So I just wanted to make sure, because in different parts, different things are reported. Be under no illusion, the economic fallout in, the, in Europe is very, very, very severe. And just some examples. Uh, the Bank of England warns that the UK is entering the worst recession for 300 years. So even after the Second World War, the economic fallout was not as severe as it is at present. They compare the drop of GDP with the winter of 1709. Um, also in the Eurozone, a big, big slump. Uh, uh, yeah, as you can see, biggest slump, uh, fastest rate on, uh, on record. So one thing for certain, only really effective boards can deal with the challenges. In the last two weeks, I had uh, calls, conversations with numerous chairmen who very openly say, I'm not sure if our boards are up to what we are facing now. This isn't business as normal. And the generation, the baby boomers who are now entering boards, have never experienced anything like it. And are they really up to the challenge? Big, big question mark. So that leads to the big question, what is it actually that makes sports more effective? As I indicated at the beginning when I referred to the copyright, um, behind this is five years of research, of academic research. We identified seven variables that are mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon and German-speaking academic literature where there is proof that these variables make a board more effective. And each of these variables that you see here are basically a lever, a lever board members can use in order to have more impact in the boardroom or in order to be collectively um, 
more effective. On our website, you can see articles. I'm happy if you approach me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to send you articles about this. But without an effective board, I can absolutely assure you that the organizations have a very high chance that they do not get through this crisis. We will see many, many businesses fail in this process because this is a marathon. This is not a sprint from now on. And all the talks about the V-shaped economy are basically thought to be very, very optimistic. Most people in Europe expect now what they call a U or an L uh, if things uh, are done badly. So we are in here for a longer slump and we need boards to be effective, to not only govern organizations, but also to be very fit and firm on developing sound strategies for the new normal, what we are facing. I might come back to this slide uh, later on. So in the board evaluations, we reveal exactly what it is, what boards can do to become more effective. And I would just like to give you a few examples that we are frequently see. First of all, individual board members very often do not understand sufficiently what is it they can really bring to the table. What is it that matters in the context of a boardroom? Somehow there, our system plays a trick with people. So our neural system. When you ask people on board, they very often refer to strengths they have heard when they were young executives. So when they were basically on a fast track in their career, typically before they become a member of an executive board, this was an exciting time in everyone's life. You know, you were rewarded, you were doing things, and every two years somehow you got a promotion. So. What you heard at that time is very often wired in people's brains. So now it's 20 years later and they think they are still this young, energetic person and they haven't reflected sufficiently what is it that actually matters in the boardroom. Boards, point one, point two, boards come together maybe anything between six times, eight times, 10 times in a year. The people might have a, a, a board dinner before the board meeting, but they don't know each other very well. So they don't understand very often how they can work collectively really well together. So they are missing a big, big trick by no, not knowing each other enough and not being able to leverage the experience, the expertise, the strengths everyone can bring to the table. Number three, the composition of boards. The composition of boards, I understand you have specific challenges in South Africa, but we have also our own challenges here in Europe. Very seldom the composition of the board is as it should be. There is simply not the right mix of know-how and behaviors across the table. Why? We all like people who are like us. So when they select board members, they are automatically geared to people whom they like, who are like them, which fosters, of course, groupthink on boards. Someone who can bring a lot of expertise to the table who looks different, who is different, who might be from a different generation, will struggle to actually get a board seat. Let you give me, give you one example. Um, one know-how area that is currently not sufficiently represented on boards in Europe is cybersecurity. Very few people who have cyber know-how and cyber attacks are of course a big, big issue uh, of threats that we, uh, we are facing now and in the future. 
the people who have this, this expertise tend to be younger. They tend to come have a military background. They might come from other countries. They are not running around in a tailored suit. They might wear a t-shirt. They might wear a baseball cap. And if they wear a jeans without that is not broken, that is already a good, uh, that's as advanced as it can get. The know-how of these people is absolutely needed. But when they go into the interview process, they're very often neglected because they do not fit in. So this composition of the board is something where a lot of work needs to be done that boards really have everything they need. So I leave this open now. I hope you have many, many questions and I look forward to being bombarded. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Sabine. Uh, I think surely you have created the environment for a lot of questions to come. Can I just, and uh, this is a neglect on my side, before I ask you some questions and see what the audience is asking on the side here, I want to introduce my colleague, which you saw, and I would like her to appear on camera, Runel Plain. She is the CEO of uh, Fluid Rock, and I neglected in introducing her in the beginning and uh, so big apologies, uh, uh, Runel, in that case. Uh, Runel is going to summarize the session for us at the end. This is a role that we change around every time that we are busy. So, Runel, now our audience has seen you and they can put a name and a title to the face. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. I'll get you back later, but thank you for this. <laughs> uh, Sabine, back to your presentation and my word, I really don't know where to start with all of the questions, but let's go to right in the beginning when you spoke the focus of the boards in terms of the mental health of people. Uh, and how would, what's the role of the board in that? Uh, people then s suddenly had to leave the office, although relatively smoothly, everybody's surprised about that, how people then adapted to it. But suddenly the social fabric is impacted. People are working from home. They have to integrate their office activities with their home activities. The children are at home. The dogs are at home. The cats are at home. Uh, the leaders have, who have to influence culture can now only do it through a screen and maintain culture of the company in this. Where, where is the board in this space? So we have seen, uh, I know of several boards who have actively asked for uh, mental health programs uh, of the employees. So there's a lot of attention on mental health, particularly in the UK. Um, this is also because the Prince of Wales has, of course, got behind a mental health initiative. And they talked openly about the death of Diana and uh, what it has done to them. Uh, so there's a lot of attention on mental health and no doubt uh, Corona, the anxiety uh, coming through this pandemic and uh, dealing now with lots of stresses and uh, strains, um, homeschooling, um, concern for parents has of course been a huge strain on people and organizations actively launch mental health programs in order to ensure the well-being of their workforce. You also spoke, uh, and I'm sorry if I jump too quickly from one category because we have limited time, uh, but you also spoke on these issues in terms of boards, but how does what you have shared with us relate to the boards in the, in, in, in the public sector, in, in state-owned enterprises, and is there a redefinition of the relationship between private companies and government at the moment going on in that environment? So basically the principles, what I talked about, and also the questions that are asked are pretty much the same also in the uh, public sector. 
So what we are seeing uh, in the financial crisis, uh, of, of course, a lot of banks had to be saved. So we saw the, uh, these partnerships between the public and private organizations. And of course, the governance is a very important part in those organizations. We see now another wave of these public-private partnerships, which are also, of course, a big uh, a, a big, big part of the South African economy. Um, so governance is then even more important. The big, big problem, the private sector resists as much as they can the influence um, from the public sector because the, the private sector feels that the people that are sent by the government are not the right ones. <laughs> that they don't have the right experience, that they never had PL responsibilities, that they were brought up in a different environment and so they think differently. So there are very big discussions going on. And at the moment, for example, we see this in Germany with Lufthansa, our prime airline, that had to accept uh, government money, 9 billion, 10 billion, in order to keep going. And of course, the German government wanted to have influence at board level. And that was the most sticky point that they had to overcome. And now they have in the legal document, they have limited actually the impact, <laughs> the influence they can have, um, even if Lufthansa accepted the monies. Mm. I have... I have questions, uh, a similar question from two of our audience. Uh, Kuena Nkate asks, how have you dealt with the biases associated with the appointment of directors who do not fit the norm? And then Trevor Harris kind of expand on that and say, what are the guidelines in working with a board that is comprised of people from completely different walks in life, represented specifically uh, interest groups? So there are no official guidelines. Of course, uh, politically diversity is encouraged, uh, but practically it's, it, it's challenging. Let's face it. Uh, we have made progress in Europe on getting women on boards. Um, but uh, for example, uh, there is a, what's called the Parker Review out, uh, which says that there should be no all white boards by 2022. Um, uh, in the FTSE environment, and of course, there it looks very bleak. I think two boards can fulfill the criteria, but 98 boards cannot fulfill the criteria. So, with all of these things, they cannot be enforced in a hard way. There are recommendations, suggestions, more or less official guidelines, but there is nothing that you can enforce these things. Um, and it's a difficult it's a difficult issue it sounds it sounds indeed difficult and it's uh, it's also something that uh, one of the audience members triforza is asking is how does it work in europe how they nominate members in south africa there are nomination committees but they are not transparent uh, who determines the skills required so we have also, any board has a nomination committee. Um, and if you are a listed organization, you need to make, you need to publicly announce every role. So you can search internally, but you also are almost obliged to go external and really compare the skill level of candidates. And this is mostly done by search companies. And then a, a, a candidate is uh, selected. So these skills are clearly defined by the nomination committees. But in practice, many nomination committees do not have the data. <laughs> uh, so we in our board evaluations provide them with the data uh, that they understand specifically what criteria what know-how, what expertise someone needs to specifically bring to the table to best complement an existing board. But very often, 
um, these criteria are, let me use a very technical term, very wishy-washy, <laughs> uh, i.e. not at all clear. Um, a chairman told me, well, these days, as long as it's a female with two arms, we, we get her on board. Um, so it, the, the problem starts at boards very often lack even the know-how, lack the data that they don't fully understand what criteria they need, what people need to bring to the table to make the most contribution uh, to the growth of the organization. And what is the practical implications for the for the nomination committee on this, and especially the leadership in the nomination committee? So what they should do is, of course, um, run uh, board evaluations and have real data, not just a subjective, qualitative insights, rather real data, which very few board evaluations at the moment bring to the table, but they need data. And the data they need to share with search consultants so that they are very clear and strong briefings. The briefings, the problem starts that A, they don't understand it, and B, the briefings to search consultants are very, very weak and far too general. Hmm. Okay, that's that's very practical advice. We have a question here that ties into one of your comments uh, a bit earlier that says, uh, why would baby boomers be concerned that the younger generation will not be able to handle the, the, the complexity? Is, isn't that a bias from the baby boomer side? It is a bias, yeah. Uh, it is very clearly a bias because let's face it, the generation who is now in their 20s, they are sitting in tech companies. They understand tech, social media, digital far, far better than anyone who is 60 plus. Yeah, they grew up differently. Even if this 60 something is, he's very open minded and he loves his grandchildren and on weekends, he plays with his new iPhone, all well and good. He simply grew up differently. Yeah, this whole education was different. He cannot bring to the table what this tech savvy 20 something wizard is, is able to do. But it's a closed social system. Look, any desirable social systems are closed shops. It's very hard to get through the door. And the people inside are, of course, have an interest to protect their interests. Who would like to be exposed and, and seen as not up to the challenge by someone who could be their grandchild? <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it, it's protection. It is discrimination, it's bias, and it's protection of interests. Because if you look at it, the average age of a board member in uh, FTSE 100 companies is 59. Yeah. Fantastic. Someone who is 59, uh, that was pre-MBA times. You know, yes, they studied. They had a fantastic career. But let's face it. They did not grow up with technology. Indeed. So, how widely is wisdom found in these boards on your side of the ocean? Uh, and I, if I talk about wisdom, I'm not necessarily speaking about ticking compliance boxes and knowing all the technical detail of an MOI, etc. But, but just wisdom of, of directing and leading. So, when you speak with uh, fund managers in the city, in London, they, they they lament a severe shortage of wisdom. Typically, they cite three to five names. That's it. So we have in the UK three to five names where they say, oh, these are real chairmen. These are real cracks. Everyone wants to have them on the board. So these chairmen that are mentioned, they typically serve on three, sometimes four boards. The corporate governance codes now tries to, to to limit this to three, 
but there is a real shortage of people who bring expertise and wisdom. And it's few and far in between. Yeah, because I think something that that links to that is maybe a challenge to the board. And I don't know if this is the appropriate question, but how would a board in this in these times, because there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of speak about the new normal or the new abnormal yeah. as someone to, wants to call it, but there's a lot of uncertainty. A number of things will be the same and some would not. How does a board balance the current reality and kind of a future reality? How does the board balance that tension between current and future reality uh, without compromising either? Very, very difficult at the moment. They all, um, they all in think strategy, they discuss strategy, they monitor the situation. They hire basically strategy consultants, uh, if you speak, or um, M&A consultants. They hire future uh, futurists. They try to understand what's going on. They try to project um, how this will map out and how they can react to this. But of course, everyone at the moment has to jump because absolutely nothing is certain. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you, you need this expertise. You also need a level of, high level of resilience um, on board. And yeah, as I said, only really effective boards will be able to, to govern and to guide their organizations through these enormous challenges. So, so given some of the questions that I see here, the wisdom that we speak about, the... Uh, the, the competencies required on boards, etc. How much effort should be made by entities, educational entities or bodies? Because you don't start with wisdom. You have to start somewhere else. How much effort should be put into the marketplace to start educating future board members uh, in preparation for this and should that education only be on technical stuff or should it uh, also cover other areas that, that you are preparing people for, a, for a, being a competent productive board member and, and with the potential to become a wise contributor. But here's a big uh, thing, the, um, the offers for boards in terms of training and also training non-executive directors have truly mushroomed in the last years. Yeah, there are quite some uh, organizations in the UK offering these training services. Um, it, it hasn't made the situation any better. It's very, it's, it's frightening, but sadly it's the truth. On the contrary, um, in the past, when uh, I speak with some of these grand chairmen, uh, they call them city grandees. Um, when I speak with these city grandees, they tell me of a time when they were mentored, mentored by people who um, supported the development of their career. And they said, this is a key thing that's missing at the moment. Yeah, the time that some people take the time and really mentor people on the boards properly. Um, but the uh, educational programs, frankly, haven't helped much, sadly. And that's almost shocking. Yeah. So uh, one of our colleagues from uh, our neighboring country that's joined us from Botswana, he asked, uh, realistically speaking, uh, young black African consultants in corporate governance or young professionals, uh, uh, aspiring to play a role in, in, in boards in future, how, how important is it also for them to be developed in terms of the whole need for diversity and if, if diversity is such a concern, not just in terms of being black, but also being young and of another gender than male? So, I mean, the Im Im important is 
to get the experience. So uh, to start maybe in the tech sector, yeah. But uh, to, to start in a in a in a sector that is more accepting to young uh, organization to young people, and get simply the experience. Uh, but there is no doubt that experience here is the key. So start in sectors that are easier. It's unlikely that you get a, a board seat at a, at a listed organization, but maybe in a private organization and in, in a young sector and, and then start to develop. Uh, and about, try to, if you can, try to, try to find a good mentor because the mentor is probably the key thing in here. Yeah and a mentor that has time to do it absolutely and and here's the problem look i was referring to many of these uh, training offers in the uk market to prepare non-executive director level uh, people one chairman basically told me look i completely disregard when people come with such a certificate he said why the people who write out these certificates i don't know any of them so none of these people have actually sat on the board of a FTSE organization, but they offer these trainings. So why should I accept such a certificate? Yeah. So what works yeah, is it's very much a reference system to become part of the, of the system that people know you, refer to you, and which is why it's important to, even if you can get on the outside in, that you slowly work your way into the, uh, into the inner circles. And such, if you have then a reference from someone from the inner circle, that's much more valuable than a, a potential certificate for which you paid a lot of money. I think, uh, I'm sorry for getting this commercial in here, but I have to take the gap. This is exactly why we partner with our, our, our partners at Fluidrop. It's exactly that, to have experienced directors, current and past, to be part of that educational moment uh, and to make sure that it resonates with what's really happening in the board. But uh, end, end of commercial. <laughs> uh, 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 just shifting again to, a, to an area that we've touched on, but a bit differently as I see the questions coming up. In one of our previous sessions, uh, one participant or one of my colleagues said that risk seems to be the stepchild of boards. And uh, you and I spoke about something uh, which you may want to touch on now, but in terms of risk, uh, and what you have, you have re referred specifically to, to cyber risk, which one of the audience members say as, as a young uh, person operating in that environment, it's very difficult to convince leaders about this, this risk. But do you think with COVID and what is happening now that risk would be, will receive much better attention, more attention, more detailed attention? Absolutely, no doubt. Absolutely no doubt. You know, we have a, a, a Better Boards podcast series and uh, it just the latest podcast just came out um, this morning and it's on bringing cybersecurity in the in the uh, boardroom. And when I talked with uh, with a partner I had for this um, podcast, Frank was saying that there is an increase of 1800 percent of cyber attacks since the outbreak of the, of the pandemic. So it's huge. It's huge and it's, it's coming. But I think it's also uh, our worldview on risk that may be at stake here. I mean, I spoke to you and you, you, you said it right immediately when I spoke to you and said, but nobody was expecting this kind of crisis. And you said, no, 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 no. Governments had to know about this before. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very clear. I mean, documents uh, emerge, documents are leaked. Uh, governments knew, knew about it. Um, in the 90s, latest, uh, they were asked to prepare for, for a potential pandemic. Nobody did. So... Um, and uh, this morning, uh, 
Prince Charles came out and say, look, uh, the more we destroy the biodiversity, the more we have to deal with pandemics. So what we are facing now is a very different time. So we have we see social unrest ac across the world. We see a, 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 a geopolitical shifts that are absolutely dramatic and massive. Um, now we, we have the health threat on, on, on the top of it. We have environmental challenges. So it all comes together now. So the risk levels, what boards have to discuss and are dealing with now are so much more higher than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. And at the moment, <laughs> They, they're all asking also, well, how do we prepare for it? So you need to have the systems that basically prepare you or warn you of the right level of risk at the moment. But the biggest challenge why you need to have this effective board is you don't just face a challenge from one area. <laughs> at the same time, you are basically confronted with a, with a large number of, of, of risks. Which, which places which places an enormous lot of pressure on boards in dealing with this complexity. Absolutely, absolutely. And information overload and complexity is, is a huge issue. But now that, and I'm sorry if I, I'm taking a kind of a dear to area, but for boards who have to make decisions, uh, I don't say it was like that in the past, uh, working on a formula in taking decisions and just in terms of compliance, but uh, making decisions in, in this complex, confusing, disorderly environment is quite, it's quite difficult. And I have a colleague that always says a better plan now, a, a good plan now is better than a perfect plan later. But there is immediate risk in, in, in saying this, but that's what business is about and that's what leadership is about. You will never cover all the risks. So you have to take decisions. How difficult, how more difficult is that becoming for boards in this space? It's, a, it's also a huge personal risk uh, for, because the chance that you get it wrong currently is high. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, of course, they try. As we can see, we even see it on the world stage. Yeah, the various options uh, political leaders have. Yeah, you can refer to someone else. You can pass on the buck. Yeah, you can make a decision. Three weeks later, you might be criticized for it. But it is actually very, very important that decisions are made, um, and leaders resist currently to make decisions because the risk that they are wrong make maybe a misstep is high. Let's face it. Yeah, we come back to the point. You need resilience. You need to be effective. You need to have the trust in yourself yeah, to be mature enough to say, okay, but I make a decision now because it's absolutely vital. And if I have to revise it in three weeks or a month, I do it. Yeah, it, it is, uh, it is an, uh an increasingly complex environment for, for boards to, uh, and, and new challenges that are coming up for them to, 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 to operate in. Um, I see if I look at some of the questions coming up here, a lot of them still refer to the diversity, the importance of diversity, etc. One of the two of the questions that are interesting coming up here is that if you do board evaluations or if you want to develop, I think one of your last, sli last slides spoke about the relationship and the team of the board as a, as a group operating together. And uh, this um, uh, person is asking here on the, on the side, but you, you never really hear of team building sessions for boards or boards going out uh, and, and, and make a, a, a an, active effort to build the relationships in the board they meet and they disperse you know i will never forget a, a conversation i had with a board member of a very well-known german car manufacturer and uh, uh, these guys are very outspoken so i was sitting in his office and he was telling me sabina 
or well, Dr. Mkowski, if you start now talking about team development, uh, I kick you out within five seconds. Yeah, we are talking about the board. Yeah, boards are for men. Executive committees, teams are for for young people. So, a very macho conversation, of course. Yeah. I'm not promoting it, which is why I'm not saying uh, the brand, <laughs> but um, it, it, it encapsulates how some board members think. They don't see themselves as a team. Uh, it's a board, and the board is different. So it, 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 this, this crisis has accentuated something else. We always speak about that borderline between being a board member and then the role of the executives. Yeah. So this crisis could almost get people to a point where they where they not ignore it, but they, they may tread into each other's space yeah. in there. But without without doing that, what treasure is there on a board in terms of innovation, of offering strategic different innovate innovative strategic guidance to the executive how, how what is what is the what is the expectation there and where is the boundaries of that advice so in the acute phase of the crisis you know when they were reshuffling how we are doing things moving things into the virtual world yeah uh, the working processes i saw a lot of boards that are very hands on and crossed the line and they were much, much more operational. I also saw that many boards had more frequent board meetings. So instead of six or eight, they suddenly talk uh, every two weeks or even every week. Um, so coming now out of this very acute phase of the crisis, the demand now is exactly like you described, uh, Frick, that they are strategic, that they are innovative. Um, but, but, but then again, the problem is very few, we have very few visionary um, people. I was doing a board evaluation of a FTSE 100 tech company just completed two weeks ago, and they all want, of course, someone like Steve Jobs. Yeah, They are looking for the next board member that can bring this visionary software uh, expertise to really tell them, well, what's the next big thing? In which direction do we have to go? But, but of course, uh, these people are rare. Uh, <laughs> Sabine, one last question, and then I'll bring my colleague, uh, Runel, back to just summarize for us in, in this. We had one of the sessions before on communication, and I see it comes up as a question here as well. Uh, on, on, on your side of the world, uh, how is the board or how are boards currently communicating, not just with shareholders, but with stakeholders? How are they doing in that space? And is there any advice coming from that? Yes, yeah, so the new corporate governance code in the UK places a great emphasis on stakeholders, on different stakeholders. So the um, communication, uh, the code demands that the communication between the board and different stakeholder groups very much increases, that there is more transparency and that there is a greater exchange. So what boards are doing is they invite people to board meetings from different stakeholder groups. They conduct marketing research surveys to better understand these different stakeholder groups. And when they make decisions that are relevant to a stakeholder group, they appoint someone from the board who then talks about the decision the board has made, goes back to the stakeholder group and, and conveys the message. It's a very important part, great question, and it's very much uh, asked for in the new corporate governance code. Sabine, thank you so much. It just seems if I look at the questions and I've really try to cover most of them, but I'm very sure a number of them are frustrated that I didn't ask you those questions and we may have to somehow have an extension of this conversation in future. But for now, thank you. I just want to hand over to Runel to summarize for us. Thanks, Runel. Thank you.
Um, thanks so much, Frick and Dr. Sabine. It's a very difficult conversation to summarize because we've touched on so many different different areas. But um, one thing that I that I kind of always quip about is that there are a lot of people who want to be directors on boards because they think it's an easy way to make money. And the moment that they realize what it's about, they don't want to be a director on that board anymore. Okay. And, and there's a lot of experienced directors who actually don't want that risk anymore. Um, and those who are there, you know, we, we don't want them to leave. So it, it's an interesting, you know, uh, kind of contradiction over there. Um, thank you for scaring me with that stat that you said that UK is having the worst depression since um, 1709, you know, because that that year Europe froze, you know, and stayed, it froze yeah. overnight and stayed frozen for, for months and months and there was food shortages. And, you know, um, and, and it does scare us because, you know, in South Africa, we're so reliant on other countries and, um, you know, and our own economy is, is currently so fragile. So basically we're saying is that, you know, effective boards will get their companies through this crisis. The, the thing is, you know, I'm looking at some of the names and I'm recognizing people and it's it's COSEX, it's company secretaries, it's directors and executives that's also on the call. And and the reality is no board is perfect, right? None of them. Oh. Looking at your, <laughs> so so would you say that it's a, it's a journey? I mean, becoming an effective. And I think the moment you have it right, it's like parenting. The moment you think you've got this, then something else goes wrong. No, it's absolutely a journey. You are absolutely spot on. A board can just try to get the data with good board evaluations and go step by step and become better and better and better. Uh, but uh, even, I mean, I, I work with some of the most respected organizations in the UK. And uh, yeah, we revealed a long list of things that they could do that makes them even better. Yeah, and, and, and if I really think about this and, and, and about the different boards where we're at, is that the problem is, is that element that you spoke of, it's, it's about self-reflection. Um, it's about, not necessarily a formal evaluation, it's about, guys, did we do a good job? Was this a good decision? Let's go back to this. Was investment, da -da -da -da, you know, so it's about going back and checking yourself. It's almost like after a project, you see, was it a good, where did we go wrong? Where can we improve? And I don't think that there's a lot of time in board meetings for that. Or given that's to right. that's right but they should do this it's exactly it's it's one of the big problems the agendas are overloaded and they don't take the time for this yes and and one of the things that you know the trust deficit in south africa especially in state-owned entities is huge so what we have is in this I, this this comment you made on lufthansa very very interesting where you've said the, the government said okay we'll give you money but then we want two board seats but, and I'm sure it's the same there, is that you can't then act, you know, on behalf of your, your person, who, your, your shareholder nominated you, you need to now act in the best interest of the company. So it's a it's something that they don't think of because then it means with tons of not trusting the board members that's there now. That's correct. That's correct. And it's very difficult to, to, to find a solution that satisfies both sides. Very, very difficult. And that's where the trust comes in and this trust deficit needs to be mended. So what we saw in our board meetings is that the companies where management and the boards had a good relationship before Corona, they kind of, um, there were more board meetings, but the board kept their distance, they didn't cross the line. But where the boards and the, and the execs didn't trust each other in any way, there were so many more board meetings. In one of our companies, they were having almost uh, two meetings a week extra, you know. Which is which is very interesting because what you have what what you do then is you cut off the wings of your management team. Absolutely, and then it is one could argue this is not anymore a board. Yeah, with two meetings a week, that's yeah, not right. yeah what a board would really do. Yeah, and all the executive do is run to 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 to, to create executives reports. So you know, so sorry, Frick. So we we have two minutes to conclude. And I think Dr. Sabine and I can go on for the rest of the um, <laughs> We can go on. It's so interesting. So my, and I know I'm supposed to summarize, and, 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 but, you know, one of the things that I find hard was there are so many board evaluation providers out there. And one of my directors said to me, my chairman said to me, we're not going to do a board evaluation because we discussed it in another board and we don't find them useful. You know, so. Yeah. Uh, what can I say? The... Um... Board evaluations have also a very bad reputation in Europe. 
because a lot of chairs and boards think they, they fail to add value. Um, thank goodness we haven't had this feedback yet. You need to do things differently and, and keep going. But yes, I completely agree with you. This is also the case in Europe. <laughs> okay, I'm glad to hear it's not just us. Okay, so, no, no, absolutely so not. I'm glad it's also your problem. So I think my last comment is that, you know, in the book, um, you know, now of lockdown, I'm reading books that I was on my list five years ago. So I just read this book, uh, Lean In by the CEO of Facebook. And basically her message is to women, it's stand up, it's your, it's the problem is not the system. A lot of times the problem is you. So if you're on a board and you're waiting for this visionary to come through your door and show you the way, you're wrong. It's about you standing up. It's about you being in any way where you are at now and standing up. Stop making excuses like I can't get into the board because I'm this, I'm that. You know, I, you know at, a, at a point my hair was blonde and I was convinced that's why I couldn't be appointed as a director. But you know, so at the end of the day, it's it's about everyone who is in their current position to make it happen, to break the ground, to, to stand up and for you to think, what is it that I need to do? Because no one is going to walk into that door and, and give you the answer. Um, you know, yeah, so that's a bit. That's a nice closing remark and that's exactly what it is about. Yes. Okay. So, Thank so, you, Rodel. That yeah. was a closing remark, but it's also opening a door to another conversation that we will definitely have on this. Thank, Thank you. you. Sabine, I know that you have got another obligation. Well, it actually starts within three seconds. So thank it's you so much for, for being here. Thank you to our esteemed audience and for your excellent participation in the question. I do apologize that I didn't get to every question in there, but I tried to cover at least the themes that are in there. This will be available on the website uh, in a day or two. We just have to edit it a bit. And uh, Sabine, hope to see you again here in future. We will have a follow-up conversation and speak to you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much uh, to everyone and the warmest regards to South Africa. Keep your country beautiful and keep going. Thank, Thank you. you. Keep well. Bye. Thank you, Renelle. Bye. You.